right before the break, I uh, explained a little bit about the mantala. Now maybe you wonder when I entered, you saw me doing a prostrations. And that you might feel like this prostration is mainly put to the, uh, the uh, great beings. Yes, it is, but uh, in Tibetan we say Ticha. So Ticha means the place where you are going to give uh, teaching is this seat. So we have to uh, make a prostration to this seat because the topic of the teaching is very important. And then the person who is saying this has to have a, a, a huge respect of this topic. Like uh, <clears throat> uh, when Buddha was giving teaching, um, I think it, normally he will teach more like very simple way, like oh, he will you know, go for baking arms and then people will just invite him inside and then he will just give certain kind of a teachings, whatever the, the family or the person needs. Uh, but especially when he was giving a teaching on emptiness, Heart Sutra. That is the time he made his uh, throne. Said, I'm going to give very special teaching. The topic is so precious. Now I may need to make a uh, special throne for myself. So he just brought maybe a piece of a uh, flat rock, what's the word, flat rock, and then put it there. That was his throne. <laughs> so organic. <laughs> so uh, this is so best is to bring down the pride. So this is necessary for the teachers. So this is uh, this tradition that we are following. Okay. Tanganzu. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow is the last day, and I think now only one more session, and we need to complete this. <laughs> <laughs> I, we all need a special power. That has some shit. Everybody drops up chair. Then <laughs> Carsore, Chasangai with regard to now having reached the first ground, having attained the path of seeing realized emptiness directly, and a bodhisattva having now attained the first bhumi, the first ground. Uh, from then onwards, the bodhisattva engages in certain practices with regard to what are called the paramitas, or the perfections, as they're sometimes translated. 
So on the first ground, the Bodhisattva focuses on the perfection of generosity, or the parameter of generosity. On the second ground, it's ethical discipline. On the third ground, it's patience, and so forth. So the emphasis is on different, uh, different practices with regard to these perfections. Now, on the first level, therefore, the focus is on generosity. So actually, a Bodhisattva practices generosity at all times. Um, and once a Bodhisattva becomes an Arya being, which is just another way of saying having realized the ultimate nature of all phenomena directly, uh, generosity is pretty much effortless. I mean, giving uh, doesn't require the same effort that it requires in our case. However, what is special about the Bodhisattva on the first ground is that there is this subtle type of uh, stinginess, like what keeps us, what, what prevents us from giving freely is a type of stinginess. So that type, this subtle type of stinginess, that is gone, which is why the Bodhisattva surpasses the practice of generosity or surpasses in that practice of the perfection of generosity on the first level because this very subtle stinginess is no longer does no longer prevent the bodhisattva from from uh, giving freely from practicing generosity in a uh, well almost effortless way and Rinpoche said this kind of stinginess it's like an imprint it's some kind of residue that's left on the mind that is considered to be a cognitive obscuration, an obscuration not to liberation, but an obscuration to enlightenment, described as a cognitive obscuration or an obscuration to uh, cognition. Anyway, so it's that kind of obscuration to enlightenment which is no longer causing any trouble on that level, and therefore the Bodhisattva has now surpassed, has attained this, this special kind of uh, practice of the perfection of generosity. So, <laughs> Well, Rinpoche says there's not that much uh, that needs to be explained in this context of generosity. However, one aspect Rinpoche would like to stress, which is on the first ground, on the first uh, bumi, as it's also called, on that first ground, a bodhisattva does a, engages in a special kind of um, generosity, which is described as a specially pure, a pure type of generosity in the sense of being aware, being aware that the person who gives, the bodhisattva, him or herself, and the, the person who receives whatever is being given, and the object that is given, the substance, whatever you give, that all those lack inherent existence, that they don't exist in and of themselves or objectively and so forth. In that sense, therefore, the bodhisattva engages in the practice of generosity, giving to someone a particular object, conjoined with the understanding that neither the object nor the person giving, uh, nor, nor the person receiving the gift exist inherently. So that is considered to be extremely effective because the two accumulations of merit and wisdom are practiced in tandem. They're practiced together. So giving uh, is associated with the accumulation of merit and then the awareness of the lack of inherent existence of the giver and so forth is associated with the accumulation of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And then also, what makes for the bodhisattvas to, to, 
when they practice uh, generosity, it is so easy for them. It becomes so easy for them. <coughs> uh, because they have given their body, mind, uh, speech to the sentient beings. Uh, normally, uh, what we do is offer our body, mind, speech to the, the holy objects like uh, Buddha, uh, Dharma, Sangha, that we offer our everything. Mm. And then here, uh, for Buddhist sattvas, because they have given everything to them, that means if somebody comes and asks, it is similar like you are giving it for them and somebody comes like I want it back. So it makes so easy for them to. But here also because um, maybe most of you are new to the Buddhism, so it, we should be very careful when what does that mean offering mind, body, speech. So it's not like the kind of actual thing you give it every to, to your uh, guru or Buddha, Dharma. It's more like we can keep in our mind like um, that means I see uh, something unique uh, body in you and unique uh, uh, some kind of a special uh, mind in you and a special speech in you and I want to exchange this so then it is uh, it's more like <laughs> it's more like you have something old phone <laughs> And you are getting a new form. <laughs> Good business. <laughs> that these days, uh, most uh, the uh, companies, they do this, isn't it? Bring your old one and we give you a discount and uh, something. So we do have this understanding. So some people get confused. So it's more like, they give the, uh, their mind and body and speech like, like they give it to their girlfriend or boyfriend. Like, oh, I love you so much. Oh, I want forever. And then something happens, then they'll pull up, full of complaints. This also happens in uh, uh, teacher and uh, student relations in Buddhism, in Hindu, and everywhere. So uh, we should be careful and understand why, why we do this, okay. Um, now, the chap uh, second chapter. Second awakening mind. Sek Thank you. Same year, right? Second awakening mind, which is the second awakening mind. Awakening mind. Second awakening mind. Okay. Now, second time to awake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That is... That sudim di kado del ya. That je desma shun des jordan bi na. That sudim di kado di na lol ya. Hani that chitim si de do si de de si ya mo wache. That ne di ning di mo chito. Sudim si de ju Sanskriti mendo di ki ke de si la do ke de del ya si la shit. Sechlido. <laughs> That depends on how much you do. For example, if you want to do something, you have to have commitment. Say, I understand. Commitment. Say, you say, oh, that's it. That's it. 
Now, the second chapter, well, the second awakening mind or the stainless, the second ground, as it's called, this, the stainless, the name of the ground. Anyway, it mainly teaches the second perfection, which is morality or ethical conduct, as it's also called ethical discipline. Now here the meaning of the word is actually, especially in Sanskrit, if you take the meaning of the Sanskrit term, which is Shilajit. Shilajit. Anyway, so um, so Shilajit. Shila means. Um, Shila Shita. 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 No, say. So uh, anyway, so Shila uh, Shita or uh, ethical conduct. <coughs> okay. So uh, the point is that the meaning of that in Sanskrit is so beautiful because the syllable shila means um, means coolness, coolness, and chitta means to uh, obtain, to achieve, uh, so or attain. So therefore, here the meaning of this, the Tibetan, it actually has a slightly different meaning. The term itself, tsutim. So tsutim. Uh, basically means to act in an, in an appropriate way. So that is the meaning, uh, basically that's how you can explain uh, the, the meaning of each syllable. So being in accordance with a, an appropriate way, the way one should behave, basically. But Rinpoche feels that the Sanskrit meaning is actually more beautiful, or this, the meaning of the word, the meaning of each syllable is actually more beautiful in the sense that any kind of trouble, any kind of problem, is considered to be hot in that sense. So like uh, heating us up in, this, in the sense of like being overheated, being uncomfortable. So suffering being associated with this oppressive heat. Whereas uh, morality then has that cooling effect to cool the mind, to, to bring down the mind, to, to calm the mind in that sense. So Rinpoche said this, this is a beautiful kind of way of looking at uh, morality at moral conduct or ethical discipline in the sense of uh, removing ourselves removing this uh, this kind of heat of of harmful actions yeah. So actually, well, when we talk about moral discipline, discipline it, it involves some kind of commitment, but commitment may be associated with like having to do something, needing to do it, because it's prescribed, it's, it's explained to be the right thing to do. But actually, when we hear the meaning of the word, of the words, or of the word shilajita, shilajita, or obtaining, achieving coolness, it shows that it actually brings us some benefit. It benefits us. If we practice moral conduct, it's not because we have to do it, because someone tells us to do it, but rather because it, it uh, removes or reduces our problems, our suffering. 
So, yeah. the one time I was um, clicking on a YouTube scrolling, and then uh, there's one great uh, Indian, I don't know if we call scholar or a kind of a Guruji, the uh, uh, called uh, Sadguru. <laughs> Sadguru, Sadguru uh, uh, he explained about uh, this uh, uh, ethical concept. Then he started to talk about the person who, if he, uh, who really wants to have a good uh, um, to engage in proper moral conduct, uh, or good moral, moral discipline. No, moral discipline. Uh, he said, should uh, follow the example of Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, then he said, at the time of Buddha, that uh, there, uh, one of his uh, 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 attendant, uh, who's very handsome, and then, uh, uh, then, with the, at the time of the the summer retreat. The summer, the summer retreat. Summer retreat. Time that time, uh, they have to stay in. Then after that, they have to go out and uh, for uh, baking arms. Arms rounds. Arms rounds. Arms rounds. And then uh, Buddha said, "Go to the you know, some family house." And uh, they have to spend uh, two or three days there, and then the family will give the uh, whatever uh, they can offer, and they so the monk should bring this donation uh, to the community. So, and then they said, well, when the Genja will gain Genja, 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 to gamble, to gamble the names who who he will go to. Oh no no! They're not getting away into the lot. And it's sorry. Um, to like a like a lottery, like a, yeah, like like a lottery yeah. to pick up uh, the name who will stay, who will go to this benefactor or not. So then uh, that uh, particular monk, uh, his name came into the, the, the uh, uh, very famous uh, a lady who is a. Uh, prostitute, and then uh, now she has to welcome him. And then monks start saying, oh, now he's in big trouble. So now I think he will come back very differently. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, uh, uh, two, two days later, what really happened was the Buddha was sitting under the tree, and then the, uh, the, the naughty monks are just like, yeah, where, where is that monk? We, we should look where, what is happening with him. So then he came with a, a nun, and then everybody said, what's happening here? And then, they make, both make a prostitution to Buddha and then introduce that lady. That lady was the prostitute. And then Buddha smiled and said, the lottery that, how it became, it's drawing really- Drawing his name, the, drawing, the, drawing, drawing the, his drawing name. Drawing his name actually become very successful. So that Buddha said, uh, like, well done, well done. So what really, uh, what this Sadguru come uh, at the end of the conclusion said, this is the power of the, uh, the, Karsuri, moral, Sudim Sunda, the moral discipline. Keeping. And that moral discipline is not affecting you, but you can bring uh, the, some kind of a benefit to others. So to be honest, sometimes uh, uh, Sadhguru's 
we, I go like, well, yes. <laughs> but some are really good. Like this, it's really good. <laughs> so this is uh, also, you can uh, put it together like this. So it will be very beneficial. In the tradition of Jibun Hyang, you should remember to use that in a saggy to your dent on the Zodu Mongoch to Tati, the Mogobche. So now we can see almost cover up the most important part of the the second awaking mind. <laughs> and uh, now the Simju Sumba, the third one, that Simju Sumba, the Sabadi. Sabati Tangazo Pitchin, me manchet, and ninety five percent, ninety nine percent la the demand of the reta. Sabas in the mena. Any chig conrogi, give me a sobati, tati, suchigi, Mazolia, Rato Gugimari, Nyoyore, Nyantobu to Guyore. Taki should be dinner umaju with Nalola, simply subenalola. Any Kondro Tati Kuran, I don't summon a young the yard. Tina and the Pandanta water will get best seven shivishing on Zolia, Ranzo in your wanting Azul to city of San Richardwa. Did you any lunch? Now, with regard to the third ground uh, that is prescribed in the third chapter, so the practices here of a Bodhisattva on the third grounds are um, there. They surpass, or they're, in, they're, they're special from the point of view of engaging in the practice of um, forbearance, patience or forbearance. So the six paramitas, for instance, the six perfections, it is the third parameter of forbearance of patience. And so this kind of practice is for 99% of all of us some type of medicine because all of us have the problem with getting angry, with having aversion at times, um, generating resentment, having resentment towards other people and so forth. So it's very beneficial. It helps us, it helps us as a, some type of medicine. And here in this text, in Entering in the Middle Way, well, it describes the disadvantages of getting angry, but not in the sense of someone just saying, well, it's really bad for you, so don't do it. Instead, it helps us to understand through our own experience how anger takes away our freedom. It um, deprives us of, the, of our freedom, of our freedom to engage in moral actions, in, in ethical actions. It takes away that freedom from us. So it's something we can understand through our own experience. Through our own experience, when we get angry, we're no longer able to engage in uh, <coughs> beneficial actions or in ethical actions. Then uh, one point in here, one of the one of the bad quality that uh, of anger is um, it really damages and breaks the uh, the relation, and that means. Even uh, we say, okay, whatever happened in the past is past. So now let's become a friend once again. We use that line so many times. Even we thought like we are back, but then one slight thing, one small thing can go back to the past very quickly. That means it has kind of uh, went in the core of your relationship and it has taken, uh, it has broken this core of the relation. 
So in here, you will be, we, I get surprised when it says how much you accumulate lots of merits. Well, merits, but just with a one, one moment having anger towards that person or to the higher person, it damages the, the, the merit. Positive potential. The posi positive potential. So, and like, I cannot believe it. How can this possible? ケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャレケワジャ
<laughs> the next um, chapter, which is the fourth chapter, uh, which describes the fourth awakening mind or the fourth ground of a bodhisattva. Well, here on this ground, the bodhisattva mainly engages in the practice of diligence or of the six perfections at least, or of the different perfections, it is the practice of diligence. And the bodhisattva 
reaches a special kind of ability when it comes to diligence. Here it also says, the, the first verse of the fourth chapter, or the first line of the first verse, it says, all higher qualities follow after diligence. All the greater higher qualities follow after um, diligence. This is not just true on a spiritual level, but also on the worldly level, in terms of our worldly <coughs> activities. Any kind of uh, desirable quality follows after diligence. Therefore, it's important that we work hard and we make an effort. <coughs> So, on the other hand, the opposite of diligence, the opposite of diligence is laziness. So we can, uh, we can be controlled by this kind of laziness of not wanting to do this, that, and the other, and not wanting to engage in, um, well, meaningful, meaningful activities. So here Rinpoche says, this is a question people ask a lot. What is the purpose of my life? How can I make my life meaningful? So this meaningful, what is it that makes my life meaningful? And so laziness prevents us from engaging in activities that are meaningful, that make our my, my, life meaningful, give, give it a purpose. And so, for instance... Um, well, the, the, the point being here, I forgot to mention one thing, so we basically don't want to engage. We kind of get sick of engaging in certain actions. We just don't have the drive to engage in those actions. And therefore, that prevents us from doing what we find meaningful in our life. But Rinpoche gave us an example. As part of the practice of concentration, so engaging in meditative stab stabilizing practices, meditative concentration, one of the obstacles to generating this kind of focused concentration is laziness. Therefore, we need to counteract laziness and also accumulate a lot of merit, a lot of positive potential. In that way, we can prevent laziness because laziness is driven by attachment and desire for certain negative, negative activities. So it gives rise to laziness in the sense that, well, we'd rather sleep and we'd rather not do anything and so forth, all driven by afflictive, afflictive desire or, or attachment. And on the other hand, if we are able to prevent laziness, then through this meditation, through this practice of uh, concentrated or stabilizing meditation, our mind becomes more stable, becomes more, um, well, serviceable. Anyway, we need, therefore, for our practice of concentration, for instance, for uh, stabilizing meditation, we need to apply a lot of effort, a lot of diligence. We need diligence. But actually, the word, well, here the term diligence is used in English in, in this translation uh, on Lama Tsongkhapa, of Lama Tsongkhapa's text, but sometimes the Tibetan word was just tsundru. Tsundru is the Tibetan word. So tsundru can be translated as joyous effort. It has also been translated as joyous effort. So Rinpoche says that's a really good term, except one aspect of it is missing, that it is joyous effort when engaging in a virtuous action, in a beneficial action. So this is important here, to have joy when engaging in any kind of positive or virtuous action. Because what we want is happiness. We want happiness. So if we want happiness, we need to create the causes for happiness, which are virtuous actions, which are beneficial actions. And thus it's important to engage in them with joy. Because otherwise, well, if we don't do that... Uh, Especially, Rinpoche says, when we practice the Dharma, therefore. So, joyous, uh, virtuous actions are associated with Dharma practice because they're beneficial actions, uh, virtuous actions, and they bring happiness. Therefore, when practicing the Dharma, one very important aspect is joy. And Rinpoche has always advised and has always done practice it himself and also advised others on this when you recite your prayers, for instance and you feel tired of it, you don't want to continue on, there's no more joy, you leave it for the time being and come back at a later time when you once again feel joy to recite these prayers, for instance. 
Because otherwise, if we don't experience joy, if we continue, if we force ourselves to engage in certain activities, in particular in context, in the context of the Dharma, we continue to force ourselves, our mind will harden. Will harden to such a degree that at a later point we just don't want to do it. It's like no way we want to do it. And we won't be able to sit down or we won't be able to engage in certain <coughs> meaningful activities. And this is something Rinpoche said he also found to be explained by Shantideva in his uh, Bodhisattva way of life. He was quite surprised that this explanation is supporting the way he's been practicing it. So he says himself very clearly, when you engage in meaningful activities and beneficial and virtuous actions and there's no more joy, leave it for the time being and come back later. So he says Shantideva is supporting uh, Rinpoche's way of going about his practice. <laughs> And then also Shantideva said, you should take a rest. Think, when you take a rest, you think, I'm taking a rest to come back and do this again. Then this rest is very healthy. So, <laughs> so this is also we need to keep in our mind. Uh, okay. And then uh, secondly, if... Uh, we have the joy, this joy, whatever you do, you have the joy. Uh, one benefit is there's no room for complaining. <laughs> you will not complain to your parents. The parents won't complain to, to the teachers. So whenever, like, even a good uh, teacher or a boss or something, he will make you love what you are doing. Like studies, they will put their effort. That's how we say he's skillful. That is the kind of we label, like, oh, he's skillful. Skillful what? Because I wanted to connect to this, but I cannot connect. But he's trying to find the joy. And then connecting, so we will do it, but then he's giving us the joy. So then uh, somehow we say, oh, he's a very skillful master. So this is needed. Okay. Um, so that is simply Shibad Savche. That I have done earlier, na, I have done something like that. That I'm just something the Andrew did it for sure. Um, that the Chigi. Dingwatin and um semdi，semdi，这把车呀的，本来我做，这是个吧，新年档，他东西，这是西个吧，新年档，他东西，那罗呢，那新年档，semdi，啊，这个semdi，这不是你得土呀去，这样呀，我让这个绿semdi，绿
and then the next chapter, which is the fifth chapter, the fifth awakening mind, which describes now Bodhisattva on the fifth ground. Well, on that ground, the Bodhisattva's practices are um, uns insurpassable or unsurpassable or, or like superior from the point of view of engaging in meditative absorption. This is the term the translator here uses, sometimes also called meditative stabilization or meditative concentration. Anyway, on that level, the bodhisattva um, attains the special type of uh, meditative concentration or meditative absorption. Now, basically, this also relates in a certain way to the Four Noble Truth, the coarser type of Four Noble Truth, the subtler. We can distinguish, distinguish between the coarse Four Noble Truth and the subtle Four Noble Truth. Now, when we talk about a bodhisattva on the path of accumulation and the path of preparation, those are the first two, level, first two levels of a bodhisattva path. It is followed by the path of seeing and then, of course, by the different grounds. Now, when you're on the path of seeing, when you're on the path of accumulation and the path of preparation, you're moving closer towards attaining yourself, the third and the fourth of the Four Noble Truth, the truth of the path and the truth of cessation. In the sense that the truth of cessation and the truth of the path are attained for the first time on the path of seeing. So a bodhisattva on the two lower levels, path of accumulation and path of preparation, is now moving closer towards reaching what is called the path of seeing. And in that way, attaining the last two truth, truth of the path and truth of cessations. Anyway, what a bodhisattva needs as part of his or her practice is meditative absorption. Because as part of his or her practice, you need to attain what is called, uh, well, uh, one way to translate it is calm abiding. Calm abiding is a very special type of concentration, a very special type of meditative absorption, described as calm abiding. But not only do you need calm abiding, you also need what is called special insight. You need calm abiding, called shamatha, and you need a uh, special insight called vipassana. So these are the two aspects you both need. In fact, not only do you need them individually, you need them in a unified state. You need both. You need calm abiding and special insight in this unified, ver this unified state. The reason being that calm abiding, this very deep state of concentration or meditative absorption, makes your mind and your body very supple, not subtle, supple, very pliant, very serviceable, it makes it very serviceable. You can use your mind and your body in a very effective way, uh, which you cannot if you lack this type of meditative absorption. At the same time, what you also need is the special insight into reality, a mind that is able to, to analyze the actual nature of, an, of, of, of phenomena, the final, the ultimate nature of phenomena. So to go di very deep into that mode of existence of all phenomena. And if you have concentration, if you have calm abiding, that very deep state of, state of focus, which makes mind and body serviceable, and you unify that, you bring this together, you unite it together with your special insight, then your analysis becomes extremely effective. Therefore, this is why you need on that level this meditative absorption. And with that, you're then able to fully realize, fully cognize the uh, course as well as subtle, uh, the, the course and the subtle four noble truth. And this would be something you should 
uh, well, maybe you have some idea what it's all about. It's 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 good that you pay some uh, attention to that, have some interest in those two versions of the Four Noble Truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tasimji Kasura <laughs> Uh <laughs> Kandestakura Kajetotslamne Tonga And next is the sixth chapter now, the sixth chapter, which describes the uh, sixth ground of a bodhisattva, which is, well, one of the most important chapters, and it describes here wisdom. So in this context, again, of a bodhisattva uh, attaining the special practice of the perfection of wisdom, so here wisdom being important, therefore in this context, uh, emptiness is set forth. Here, wisdom referring to the wisdom realizing emptiness in particular. So emptiness is set forth as one of the main topics of the sixth chapter. And nowadays, well, emptiness is very popular. A lot of people, it's famous, it's, it's well liked, a lot of people like emptiness. And also among the Tibetans, um, emptiness and bodhicitta, the Tibetans, you know, just ordinary Tibetans are also quite familiar with these two concepts of emptiness and bodhicitta. And now the question that arises is how to practice emptiness. This is explained here uh, really well. Now, when we first hear about emptiness, when we first receive a teaching on emptiness, um, you find there are different people, of course, different people having different reactions. Some people who have strong imprints, past imprints, having heard about emptiness before, 
um, it may actually generate a sense of joy, strong sense of joy. They hear emptiness and they feel joyful. Don't really know why, but there's a sense of joy because of these past imprints. And there are also, of course, those who have strong imprints, strong kind of um, past imprints, something, some residue left on the mind due to having heard of empty, from ha having heard about emptiness in the past, who easily understand the concept, don't have a hard time when it's explained to them, um, grasp, they grasp the meaning of emptiness quite easily. But there are also others who when they hear about emptiness for the first time, it generates fear in their mind. It scares them when they hear about emptiness. Others may not like emptiness because they fall into the extreme of nihilism. Right away when they hear that phenomena don't exist in the way they appear and so forth, they have a sense nothing exists, which may scare them or make them unhappy. And again, they don't really like to hear about emptiness. So it's extremely important, therefore, to be careful when a teaching of emptiness is given, when someone explains emptiness. But here, being careful doesn't just refer to the Lama who gives the teachings. It also refers to the audience receiving the teachings. So both need to be really careful when receiving this type of teaching. And then Lama Tsongkhapa here is uh, uh, giving, adv giving advice, saying to the both person who uh, first hear about uh, emptiness has a goosebumps and the tears of the joy, joy tears of joy tears of joy Lose and then uh, on the other hand there's a person who maybe quite kind of like uh, uh, when hear the emptiness then there's a fear or kind of like a f feeling like a karsubata. Uh, Dislike. Disliked. Uh, the, the advice from Lama Tsongkhapa is very powerful. He said, uh, um, first, whether you have a joy or goosebumps or you have like a fear or else, both has to come to the a kind of a common ground that they need to check why I like uh, the emptiness and the other person has uh, something to offer it's like why I don't like emptiness so they all have to come on one point what is emptiness so they need to investigate this so and then uh, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa said, uh, when Chantakirti said, whether we have to check that person has uh, a seed, has a seed to listen to the emptiness or not. So it is really difficult. <laughs> if I look at you, all of you, where can I see the seed? <laughs> but the person, all the person has actually the, uh, the answer is very simple from my point of view, from Buddhist point of view, we all have the Buddha nature. So we do have the seat, of course. But that here, what Shantakirti is saying, do we have a kind of a, s a strong, Merit to understand the emptiness in this life and to realize directly emptiness in this life. That is the, what uh, oh, he is talking about, whether we have the uh, seed or not. So now, Lama Tsongkhapa said, in order to, to recognize this seed, uh, one should uh, the have a good uh, guidance, uh, good guidance, the person who has a quite good understanding on emptiness. And second is, you need the joyous effort. Again and again, when just not to give up, 
just uh, regularly you wanted to check your mind and why this suffering, why this, uh, uh, why I'm so narrow-minded, why I'm so fixed, <laughs> all these questions. Normally we complain others, <laughs> now it's complaining about yours. <laughs> so then slowly, slowly, uh, you will have a kind of a, uh, one of the best solution here, I will just bring the, the chef, the tango, the karsure. Tango? Tango. Tango um, means negating the self. Yeah, negating the self, that uh, in the later part of the sixth chapter, it will come, but I don't know whether we will complete tomorrow or not. <laughs> but let me bring this now. It's a good uh, point to, to share. Uh, uh, in uh, in the West, uh, the scientists in Greek, like uh, His Holiness, always say, um, what is that? Quantum the, physics. Quantum physics. Uh, when they did some research, and then they come, they they explain something like. There's so kind of research called, uh, not research, there's something called, could be, emptiness could be there. <laughs> so His Holiness like quantum physics a lot. Uh, but we should uh, ask, when we do lots of research and everything, and if I tell you to, okay, make an investigation, where is this table? And then we do a kind of like analyze, oh, the, these four legs are not table. That color is not table. The shape is not table. Mm, where's the table now? So is this a real emptiness? Oh, you said no. So yeah, somebody please give the, <laughs> we wanted, I wanted to hear. Is it raining? <laughs> What's happening now? <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, did it, did it. Sorry? Is it the thermos? What is that? Is it the thermos? He's asking, is it the thermos? I think Rubishi said, like, just not finding, like, taking the thermos, not finding the object, is that uh, emptiness? Oh, it is. Not finding, are you, people get idea of when you research and you cannot find the table, then they're seeing the emptiness of table. No, Rinpoche. Okay. You're not doing, doing conventional analysis, not mm. ultimate analysis. Uh, okay. The objective uh, table is not in the path. In the parts. Are you saying like inherent? So you must find that there's no inherently existent table. Is that right? Or an yes, objective? Yes, yes. Table exists. Oh, Okay. That's a good one. Still, there's a debate. <laughs> <laughs> So when we get uh, angry, the, the question continues, so better you hold to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so when we get uh, angry towards the enemy, so when we see this, when angry comes, then there's a target, that enemy, solitarily there. So. Can we differentiate between uh, Gajigi, ga, Gajagi, Gajadi, Gajigi, object of negation, mm. object of negation mm -hmm. that enemy, and then there is a, a the basis of the, the enemy, basis the enemy, to see what is it? Enemy, the null, enemy, the only Rangan and Dubi enemy, Chick Che, any Rangan and Madu, Tanya Dubi enemies, Nichi, any. 
So when we perceive an enemy, can we distinguish between an inherently existent enemy, an enemy who exists from his own side, or a, an, an enemy who does not exist from his own side, but exists merely conventionally? Can we actually distinguish between the two? Can we differentiate between the two? A truly an inherently existent enemy and a merely conventionally existent enemy? Um, the enemy as a person we can distinguish, but then if it's uh, not objectively existent, probably it's not an enemy. The if the person, enemy doesn't exist objectively, he's not an enemy? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but the person <laughs> is a person. You can't, you, if you have anger at all, that means you're uh, seeing objectively existed person. So if there's no more enemy, once you, so what you're saying is once you've realized emptiness, you overcome anger, and if there's no anger, then there's also no enemy. So remember she asked, is there also no more bad? Once you realize emptiness, does bad no longer exist? No, there is bad. There is bad and there's harm. That way yeah. the enemy can be harming you, but still be not objectively existent. Oh, does the Buddha have enemies? Is it possible for the Buddha to have enemies? From Buddha's, you cannot answer from your own. Now you have to answer from Buddha's point of view. <laughs> no, no, Buddha has no enemy. That Buddha is not enemy. Does the Buddha have patience? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so today I defeated one Geshe Doji Damdula. <laughs> she's debating Geshe Doji Damdula because she's a yeah. disciple of Geshe Doji Damdula. <laughs> it's a bit tricky. It's a little bit tricky. So it is really necessary. Uh, because when we investigate emptiness, many people think uh, when if you look at the Heart Sutra, then there is this analytical meditation to find where is this I. <laughs> and then that even a small child can answer that. This is not me, this is not me, this is not me. They can answer this. So the emptiness is not that simple. So the answer to that, it is in the uh, the Tango uh, Tango. Tango uh, so uh, negating the self. Uh, refut refuting. <coughs> negating or negating, refuting the self. Uh, yeah. Negating the self. In this, th that kind of chapter, uh, it talks about So in here that it says, a uh, person who really wants to practice emptiness, the one should first come to know as Buddha has taught the Four Noble Truths, saying like, first know the suffering. Then once, what does that mean, know the suffering? That means we don't know our own suffering very well. So once you see, oh, these and these and these comes from this grasping, that's Self-grasping is kind of the one, it, all these negative emotions and this, uh, right now I complain a lot, all this comes from this. Then there will be one question. 
eagerly you would, would come up. You really wanted to say, is there a way to get out of this? So then, when we try to find, there is no such something to grasp on. What this mistaken mind is already mistaken. To see this mistaken mind as a mistaken is a gift. This is the powerful one. And then automatically when you come to realize this good news, like there is the hope. And then once you try to try to find there's no truly existence I. I, there's no truly exist I. Every time you try to meditate on that, it becomes our hope. So Rumpji, I'll just ask about a certain verse as part of this uh, text, Entry into the Middle Way. It's a very important verse. Uh, it's verse 120 of the sixth chapter. So here it's translated as seeing with their wisdom that all afflictions and all faults stem from the identity view grasping at the perishable collection and knowing that self is the focus of this identity view the yogi engages in the negation of selfhood. <laughs> Nyomodo, あ、ダンジンギミペタテタ。あね、ナンペタテニ。ノ。あね、サムタンタロハヨバ。チクトンヨンデュ。あね、シネ。あじめミペタテキャプトゥビヨソンチ。うん。ディサムロレオンデュン
and then misperceiving that self as if existing from its own side, inherently. That is the aspect. So you need to distinguish, Rinpoche says, between those two, the self that actually exists, the conventionally existent self, and negate what is unrealistic, which is the self's inherent existence. That needs to be negate, negated. So knowing that the self is the focus of this identity view, the self here is the actually existent self, and that the identity view, its aspect, which is inherent existence, that needs to be negated. And in that way, the yogi engages in the negation of selfhood. This is what Rinpoche just explained. Mm. Mm. So now, in order to see these uh, differences between the, uh, maybe a dadela, maybe uh, dadela focus, focus, the focus which is the conventionally existent I. That oh, do you do that? Do you that? Yes. Okay. And, and the aspect, aspect, which is the unrealistic, on unrealistic self. self. So in mm. order to understand between these two. That's what we are studying. That's why studying is important. So, uh, uh, and then after that, uh, as uh, the, you know, we debate, so that there is a kind of a, lots of a confusion will come up. And then, some people say when people go into deep meditation, and then there's no more I now, right? mm. and there's no consciousness, and there's no Buddha. So they say this, but the, these, these people who say this also use the quotations of the Buddha. <laughs> That's confusing, right? <laughs> So it's necessary not to get confused. We are already confused. <laughs> so no, we don't want more confusion. <laughs> so it is necessary. What is the most important is use your own intelligence now. And then, as Lama Tsong Rupa said, with a good guidance, and then uh, Occasionally, when Lama Tsongkhapa have a direct uh, communication with the Manjushri, the Lord Manjushri, his advice will be like, read, uh, practice and read Buddha Palita. Mm. And then also Chandakirti's uh, the commentaries. So in Lama Tsongkhapa's, uh, I think uh, in the prayers to the dependent origination, he says, Chant, uh, Chantakirti, chant, chant is a moon. So the, due to the kindness of the moon shine, then I can see the uh, or then I can see the uh, what uh, the uh, maybe Nagarjuna has planned. Uh, and then also uh, the kindness of the, my gurus, and then also uh, the Nagarjuna, the uh, Manjushri's blessing. So I see now how the dependent origination is so important. He said that. So Manjushri's advice is, you have so many doubts, sometimes you can ask me, sometimes you have to do your job. <laughs> <laughs> so one time when the Lama Tsongkhapa have a, a, a kind of a uh, um, realization and then he, he checked with the Manjushri, he said, no, 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 this is not the right way. And then as everybody, he wants Manjushri to say something. And that's the point Manjushri said, now you need more purifications. 
and I will help you to pick up who will accompany you in the retreat. That's powerful. And then uh, what kind of practice you do, what text you need to read, that I advise you. So he read that, and then during that time, maybe Lama Tsongkhapa became become very famous already at that time, with thousands and thousands of students. And then he said, I'm trying my best to serve or preserve Buddha Dharma, and many students are there. And then just stopping it and going into retreat for some years will be not impact my students. Then Manjushri said, leave this to me. I know what is the benefit or what is not. And then Lama Tsongkhapa went to practice more. And then uh, for a long, after a quite a long time, then he has a vision of Buddha Palita, the great Nalanda Pandita, and then giving the real teach, essence of the teaching. And there, Lama Tsongkhapa has a, a doubt and then he, when he taught this particular teaching, it went directly like this. And this is the time Lama Tsongkhapa said he got the realization. So, <clears throat> so yeah, it is uh, uh, very necessary for us, uh, as Lama Tsongkhapa here, it says that uh, with the blessings of the, uh, the good guidance and then your own effort and uh, uh, and then not letting your wish to uh, know the emptiness that we have to bring which uh, the Gishima uh, the red which uh, the quotation from the uh, the refuting the self in there saying how the uh, yogi. how yogi uh, practices emptiness. This is how he said. So not like I wanted to know the emptiness, where is I? And then just look for it and then you say, I cannot find I, that's it. So that's not a, a full picture. So the real is something before researching uh, emptiness, person should really need a kind of a, a craving uh, to understand the emptiness. So that craving only will come when you feel like I had enough, I had enough now. And now I will not surrender anymore. I will be strong forever. And what is the antidote for this? So then it's more like you cannot s stop. Uh, there is nobody in this world who can uh, like uh, maybe from, uh, even he sits inside and not meeting anybody for rest of his life. He will get news bad news and everything. He gets upset, everything. But there's no way to stop from the harm from outside unless you don't become strong inside. So now that means unless we don't get like uh, so strong that any kind of things, good things, bad things, uh, uh, comes in the environment where you are staying, but you can stand strong. That means not staying strong like a, a statue, with the feeling to be strong is really means strong, uh, uh, strong person. So this feeling, now how to stop this is, all we need to go through the or the root of the suffering, this pain, these uh, things that I always complain, you have to connect. This is the number one uh, homework we should do. We should know how to connect these all the things of the 
uh, suffering and the mistaken mind through this grasping. And once you see, now I really know the mastermind. This is it. So now I need to, I had enough to uh, put up like a, um, like a, a distance, like if attachment is coming, then you will say, oh, I will not look at it, or I will not eat it, right? That's not going to work. For how long are you going to stop like this? So now, you should make your mind very strong. Even you are with this person, you are not uh, getting any kind of a, uh, kind of a impact, impact or influence. Negative. Negative, negative, kind negative of. influence from that person. So, for that reason, we can say Buddha does have an enemy. Buddha, <laughs> there goes Buddha does have an enemy, and but uh, he has a power to not see the enemy as oh solitary enemy. Why Buddha can Buddha sees from the different angle. Because he, he does not have this grasping towards this enemy. Because you can see, like, at Shanti Deva, uh, in the sixth chapter of the patients, he's, if you look at it, the one main thing he will uh, explain to us is, where is so-called this real enemy? And then he tried to find out, uh, if we really dig out where is this enemy, then automatically there is this we are like wishing to harm you. So that wishing to harm you is actually the, we talked yesterday about he or she does not have a control. That person does not have a control when you realize this. And then you feel like if you really want to become angry to that person, actually the right way will be, I'm angry towards that person. Uh, I'm getting angry um, with the fact that this person is under the control or the sway of his illusions or his afflictions. That's what we should get angry with. This is, the right control. this is the right way. So, as His Holiness Dalai Lama always say, we should always distinguish between the people and the behavior, the person and the behavior. Unless we don't get a good understanding of emptiness, we can't do this because it is so fixed. So uh, that's why we can say emptiness makes our mind more relaxed. So that, then once we have this relaxed, that means we can see whole picture. So then you can say, from the perspective of that person, uh, why under the sway of that uh, mind, how harms, I say he is my enemy. But I will not say the real enemy is that person. Chesanga Kansa Koranki Jobatam Kansani Yewaji Awoj Jeshambina and Kansa Gi Jobati Majugi Yomovi Shawanjing Yinza I'll ne kiss chogri ki sigri sech a kansa la ningji yobche and it jobal ya sabat sabatin techi. Yes. Now, therefore, we need to differentiate between the person and their behavior. So there's a difference between those two. And when we say the person is under the sway of their afflictions, well, the actions of that person, the behavior of that person, that is under the sway, under the power of um, their afflictions. 
And the person, therefore, we should have compassion for the person and be patient with their behavior. So, uh, does it make any sense? Okay. Oh, actually, now we have to stop here. It's already 3.10, uh, so 20 more minutes. So, yes, this gentleman has one question. Wait, just a sec. Hello. Rupa say how do we differentiate the person from the behavior, like, I, like from the point of view of logic and debate, we understand that. Uh, but when we say um, it's the person and the behavior is the same, it's like we're just simplifying it. Uh, deep inside, we understand that. But um, how do we do that when it's Mao Zedong or Hitler? You know, you can, <laughs> say, you can say that like it's his behavior, it's not the person, and I can feel compassion towards it. But such people need to be stopped, and the only way you do it is not like just by you know having non-violence. You need to do, you need to have uh, strength against such people. Mm. So I think that conventionality helps mm. uh, in tackling these people, mm. because just sitting in emptiness will not help. By uh, you know, yeah, that's true. Because uh, uh, if you are talking with the Mao Zedong then you might change a little bit. <laughs> so, that's why I said compassion, patience, using the wisdom. So, wisdom has a power to differentiate between this. So, it's saying, like His Holiness Dalai Lama says, I still have a, such a hope and a respect to the uh, people of uh, China. But then the government policy that I don't have much hope there. That's a very p clear picture. The policy, the policy somehow, uh, even you can complain like the way of you saying this, doing this, I have lots of doubt. But that doesn't mean we don't need to become friends. We can still be friends. We can work together. So, but it, 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 like in a company, in a family, different views are always there. If there's two people, two, brain, uh, two different brains, two different minds. So that means we should be ready to accept anything that what he says. That accept doesn't mean you have to agree everything. When you think this is harmful, then you can say, well, up to here, I agree with you. This one, I can't, because this is not helping, but it brings more problem. So then your actually holding your position. So that uh, we should do. So like uh, uh, this, uh, the morning we read this 17 Nalanda Pintitas. We praise to them. But look at this thick book. In there, it's a debate between Chantakirti and Baba Viveka. And the fool, like, I'm not going to agree with this. You are a great master, but on here, I cannot agree with you. This is good. So, and it's not like, <laughs> if we are like a Chantakirti and you are like a Baba Viveka, we can do like, I see this text like, I'm not going to read this book. We, we are two different people, we cannot work together. But they are working together. They see that their, their reason why they are working together is this so-called emptiness is so helpful. And but the way you dis describe, there is a little bit of harm in there. And then somebody said, no, 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 no. This is not the, way, the right way of understanding. And this is a better way of understanding. So we do this. 
So to make uh, my long, long answer very short <laughs> would be uh, we have to see this person can be changed. Like what about Mao Zedong? Uh, that was your uh, question like now we cannot see Mao Zedong anymore. But his policy, his way of un understanding, his policy is still running on. So they are thinking, their point of view, it is so good, right? Mao Zedong did it to protect his power or to make China much stronger. And America is doing the same thing. Russia is doing the same thing. <laughs> That's how somehow the, the war is there. But it doesn't mean that that uh, you should do what you are doing. But it's more like you should know when it's too much, when it start harming each other. These. That's why His Holiness Dalai Lama is saying. Now all the schools in this world need some extra education, which is not just a modern education. They need to recognize whatever we have this uh, karsate, uh, secular, secular, secular ethics. ethics. So these, these are something that we need to pay attention. And then we can bring uh, less Mao Zedong. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a difficult to answer. But anyway, uh, I think uh, uh, best way first change yourself, and then st start changing others. Otherwise, sometimes if you are not strong enough, you try to change others other people will change you. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Yeah, it's pretty much, uh, my question is, uh, will be pretty much on the same topic. So someone, uh, I have friends from both sides uh, of the war, and also I, have no, I know people uh, who are, are like supporting other side, I know people who is strongly on the side like of Russia, strongly on the side of Ukraine, they are hating each other, and I, I know both of them. And so uh, I probably will come home and they will ask me, okay, what you learned there? <laughs> and I of course will not uh, give him, I know that uh, they, it, the answer will be like, a lot of education and all of this uh, thick book, uh, but what will be uh, uh, the best approach to emphasize for these three types of people, like uh, Ukrainians uh, who hate uh, the Russians, who took their home, how the best to speak to uh, Russians who have this uh, shame uh, and how to speak uh, to Russians who are convinced that we are their enemies. Mm -hmm. Because I want to, I feel very like confused, uh, not connecting to uh, these people, and I even confu I'm confused uh, myself. But I really want to, I don't know which sides uh, like to choose, not mm -hmm. speaking to Russians or speaking to them. And uh, what will be the best approach to, uh, to connect with these kinds of people? So uh, I think the best way for us in this kind of a situation, it's not only about the uh, Ukraine and Russia, and like in, in India, like Pakistan and uh, India, and then you go everywhere, there's something, something like this everywhere. So. We have so much. Uh, we distinguish. We are partial towards certain people. Like people. We're not impartial. We're in part. We so distinguish between those, these and those. Yeah. Uh, the 
Yes. So it's like the Dalai Lama, His Holiness the Dalai Lama often says, he says, I'm not the Dalai Lama. I don't feel I'm the special Dalai Lama. I feel I'm a fellow human being like everyone else. So that is an important uh, statement we should keep in mind. Mm. Then it will be more to, if you are, in, you are, you sound like you are in the middle. <laughs> middle person so it's like uh, uh, we don't need to look very big picture of russia and ukraine but if we look try to in the family you you are the father or the mother who loves the, the both children very equally but then there is sometimes that uh, child do right and wrong, and that they got in the fight. If you say you are wrong, you are right, then it leaves some kind of a strong, uh, sort of pain, pain. pain. Uh, even that person did something wrong. But if being skillful, what will you do is, at the moment, because you to start something very bad in a family. So I'm not agreeing with you in anything. Just stay in the middle. Just noodles. Mm. Stay in the middle. Mm. That that is the the best approach. So then if other person really wants to do something, a solution to stop something, then you you can give this uh, teaching or this kind of a support saying this way of thinking it is really uh, harmful shouldn't do this even the ukraine side you can say that and the russian side but here once things get so conflicted and then sometimes we try to help you from your intention it's 100 percent pure and then the if the person the right, not the right timing, and that kind of uh, attitude becomes dissolved into something, and it doesn't bring any kind of benefit from there. So sometimes, what in the Buddhist timing, it happens like uh, uh, the king is going to war, and then he says, "Give me the blessing to win the war." And the response to the Buddha is like. And then he will pray. He will pray. But then the, the person who is going to war is thinking, oh, Buddha prayed that we will win. But he does not need to know the whole thing there. Because he's not ready for this. If you say, no, 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 oh, may the best person win. <laughs> That's not the answer that he wants to uh, listen. So it's the same situation right now. The both are so heated at the moment. So sometimes we need to take a step back and wait for the right moment. So like, even we are like uh, so angry, and then even your teacher is close by and say, don't, don't fight. What happens? <laughs> <laughs> You will say, you keep quiet for a moment. <laughs> Let me do my own business. <laughs> that will come out. So the, the skillful teacher will not say anything. You watch it. And then when he gives the timing, and then he will give the right attitude. So this we should learn. So right now it's going crazy, so crazy. So that was sometimes say, what can I do now? Only pray. So this is the situation at the moment like this. So 
So we cannot say this is right, this is wrong. <laughs> it's a difficult situation. So, uh, and then the, when the person really wants to say, we had a very difficult time, and then we can go, oh, now we need a good leader, a person who is so honest, so caring. Before starting the war, we should think about the people. These kind of people is needed as a leader. Oh, then choosing the leadership and the education and then the harmony, uh, then it will be very good. Otherwise, we, we don't have this kind of education, this kind of uh, His Holiness wish to bring the ethical, uh, the, uh, the secular, secular ethics. ethics. I think uh, next generation, next generation, it will become worse and worse now. So we need this urgently. Yeah. So I think one more. So, okay. I think she, she took us here. Yeah, so I was wondering, because you were talking about um, differentiating, like, how do you di differentiate between laziness and, like, non-joy when it comes to, like, doing, like, a positive action? So, like, when is it laziness and when is it non-joy? Non-joy. And how do you know? Mm -hmm. Non-joy, mm -hmm. non เลโลนี่ก็ยังคันเสียทุกข์อะไรอะไรดีเลยยังจิมนังจิมนังเดิมแบบนี้น้องจอยตั้งอันนี้เลยเนี่ยถ้าสุดท้ายออกมาละภา
लहलो चिकटी अने जिंगाजू चिकटी यंत्रा ले या को चिके चुन्दू सुन्दू बची को चुन्दू से उमरे को एफर्ट सर्व ये दे बकान्शी चिकला दिखे ले को दिखे के ले के माँ को छे वंदु चंबे अने सेम ना लो ले या ना चिके को किमनांग के छोआ किमनांग के छोआ जितो ये छोउ रे दे दिखे चीसो Tentu kita cakap betul le ya, parti cik itu na, tiang le lulus. Pena, pena cik orang tu, cik ni amli cik tak kandung kejauh le semua yang buat cik sambil jual di kapal, ane rancing ke yang semua lalu le ya, ane football kau yang bina, ane football ke cik tu pe cik tu ni ni tujuh mahu siapa je tang tu aje, tadi cik bina. Tiang lelok tu ses, tadi semua tu. Tiang yang aku nak tu tu. Nasi, tak cik susu cik thomi gigi thomi gigi cawal la mix je sila. Oh, senja ya betul. Oh, senja cah dulu tu na. Tiang ti ti kia betul ya. Parji cik tu na semua. Nasi. Tiang ane lelok tu tu tu. So the way we usually understand laziness, well, when you actually have the wish to engage in a positive action, in engaging in practice and so forth, but you may face an obstacle in the form of attachment towards football, for instance. So in other words, in a meaningless kind of activity, meaningless in the sense that it keeps you from doing your practice. So when you have that kind of attachment that becomes so powerful that you can no longer do your action, do, do, do your practice, but instead go to play football, for instance, well, that is also considered to be a type of laziness. So it's driven by that kind of attachment. But I'm a smart. So I like football, <laughs> but then I use like, I will practice and read and uh, study this very well. And as a gift, I'm going to watch the football. <laughs> <laughs> uh, occasionally, I think like this. Mostly it is like part of laziness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we do the dedication. It's not on. It's on? Do you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> dedication but maybe we do it in English and then you can listen well. Having thoroughly investigated in accord with all that I have heard day and night through the four reasonings, mind born of reflection on these topics of contemplation, may this discernment sever all doubts. And then we do the long life prayer for His Holiness, also representative for all our teachers and especially Second Sanjo Rinpoche. In the lands and circles by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. A powerful Shenrezig Tenzing Yatsu, please remain until samsara ends. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus, may I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. By completing the qualities of the grounds and path, may I quickly attain the state of Vajradhara. I fully dedicate all these virtues to be able to train just like the hero Manjushri, who knows reality, and just like Samantabhadra as well. I fully dedicate all my roots of virtue with the dedication praised as the best by all the gone victorious ones of the three times in order to have good conduct. With my heart going out with great compassion, 
In whatever directions the most precious teachings have not yet spread, or once spread have declined, may I reveal this treasury of happiness and aid. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, patience to listen to my broken English. <laughs> oh, then you know about tomorrow's program? Uh, tomorrow His Holiness will give the teaching and then there won't be a morning session and then the uh, afternoon session will start from two o'clock. So I will see you tomorrow then. <laughs> <laughs>